Okay. Yeah. All right. Hello again, everybody. Hello to Marvin, who's sitting right here. Yeah. And everybody on the screen. Welcome to everybody. Um, Ted, who has much richer background than I do in things like history and literature and and um and many more as a professor. And he wrote me about a different take on Mickey Latestere and it really got me to thinking because even though I called it anti-Semitism is an old trope, I don't think that we have to limit ourselves to only look at it that way. And maybe we can branch out as people want to offer different readings. I, I don't think we'll have time to do this, you know, different lenses of everything, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure that we don't think that this suggestion is actually the only one that there is. There are many ways to read it. And and there's certainly in the Talmud, in our in the Gemara and in commentaries, there's a constant um tension between was Ahashverosh foolish and led by Haman through everything? Or was he really very smart and also anti-Semitic and he was he was in cahoots, basically, yeah. but not that he was very stupid, but that he was actually very smart and cunning, I would say, and had an underpinning of anti-Semitism. I mean, that yeah. come up even if you say that Haman, you know, um, yeah. was the one who led. Yes, Vivian. Yeah, I was thinking that um, the main thing that, that these anti-Semites did was to prevent the Jews from from uh, protecting themselves. They, yes, they yes. would find ways that... Right. Oh, wait, wait, but hold, like a, wait, wait, but hold that thought. We haven't gotten up to that edict yet. Okay, but I remember, uh, you know, in studying European history and what the Russians did and the Polish and all that, they they did not allow Jews to own land, which meant that they could not grow their own uh, uh, food. They were dependent on the the the, the Gaim to provide food somehow, so they had to. For, they had to travel and bring bring fancy. So it has an effect, uh, a long reaching. In order effect. to get the food somehow. So they, yeah. they weren't allowed to. Right. No, so that's important. And Vivian, let's keep that in mind as well, that yeah. we will look for yeah. nuggets of those things. And that, and of course, what you're saying is true that, remember, we spoke about that when Ahasuerus said, oh, I can't repeal my edict. Oh, but I'll add another one allowing Jews to fight back. So what does that mean? that you put yeah. out an edict that all Jews have to kind of lie there and be slaughtered. No, I mean, it wouldn't allow them to have uh, well, well, that's weapons, whatever, whatever. whatever uh, so so let's, let's, let's just hold that thought and keep it because when the edict goes out, that's a very close reading of it. And given all that, I wanted to give Ted an opportunity to offer a different lens, which I know other people have run and I don't, I, I don't want anybody to think the only lens is the one that I'm bringing. It's, it's a new one for me, especially given the times. I'm not going to let go of it, but it's also bringing in midrashim that deepen our understanding. It's not like every single midrash or interpretation that I'm going to bring has to do with anti-Semitism specifically. And some of them, to me, felt a little too far, like too far kind of off the beaten path. Like it took it too far to try to read something into the pasuk. But um, I would really want to invite Ted, if you don't mind, before we even begin, to offer us just another lens, however you see it. Okay, well, let me, let me begin with a, a short introduction, uh, be, supporting what you just said. Uh, Rabbi uh, Brad Hirschfeld, is that? That's Hirschfield. right. Hirschfield wrote a book. I never get the title quite right, but it's something like, you don't have to be wrong for me to be right. Mm. I think that's uh, what it is. I just read that book. Yeah, it's. I, I think that's a really important line. Um, even if he hadn't written the rest of the book, I love the title. <laughs> that's it. Just the title. Sell it. Make a lot of money. I get it. Uh, <laughs> but but the the point is that I'm not saying that that I'm right and other people are wrong. I'm saying that this is another way to look at it. And I think that what's happening now is that we are all looking at things through a lens of anti-Semitism, which is completely understandable. But um, uh, one time years ago, I was in a class with, many of you probably remember, Rav Ori. Topolovsky. 
Topolovsky, yeah, uh, he was a wonderful teacher. And we were looking at uh, one of the, the, the books in Tanakh and I started giving some historical background and people started getting upset. And he said, wait a minute, these are different approaches. One is a historical and one is a religious approach. So I'm partial to both. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's important when we look at Esther to, to take into consideration uh, the fact that there was a, a there are a number of uh, uh, they're called sometimes they're called novels sometimes they're called stories um, none of these terms are exact but but works from around this time that were written in Hebrew or that were written among Jews um, that were largely for entertainment and I think that Esther is one of those. It's, I think it's a very funny book with serious overtones. Um, I remember when we belonged to a, Phyllis and I belonged to a shul uh, in a small town and we used to use a Megillah. And uh, every year when we would read it, I would, I would be amused because there's a scene in the Megillah that they didn't translate. And if you recall, toward the end of the book, uh, Esther is confronting uh, Haman and Ahasuerus uh, with what Haman is doing. And the king gets very upset and he leaves. And Haman throws himself on the bed to, to plead with Esther. And Ahasuerus comes in and he sees him on the bed and he says, this too? You know, you're, you're yeah. doing this too? And they didn't translate that because it was a little too risque for that translation. <laughs> but that's a funny scene. That's Haman being shown as an idiot and being caught in a, a trap of his own making. And Ahasuerus completely misunderstanding. It just, there's, or uh, wait, Ted, or deliberately, right? We don't know, right? When we get there, we're not there yet. It's in Parakhet. Right. But but I'm saying I always read it as deliberately, but let's not, you know, jump the gun on that one because we'll mean, get there. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean by deliberately. Oh, that he's that he really understood what was going on and he oh, just- Oh, yeah, yeah, Hashverosh deliberately yeah. misunderstood. So again, okay, so oh, these yeah, are- No, no, no I, I, I wouldn't argue with that. I'm just saying that it's it's a funny scene. Yeah. It's a, it's a very funny scene when uh, Haman thinks that Hashverosh wants to honor him and yeah. he said, oh, yes, this is right. what you should have him paraded it's through the city. Sarca sarcastic humor, really, right? Well, it is, it, but it's making a fool of Haman. This is the great mastermind of this right. evil plot who keeps doing stupid things. Oh, so that's interesting. Well, you're hanged on his own gallows. Right, and what's interesting for me is that, right. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but what you're bringing up some ideas for me, like, I would say the more traditional read is that Ahasuerus is the stupid one or the <laughs> foolish one and Haman is very cunning and wise. Not wise, I hate that. That would not be a good word for me. Clever, how about? Okay. And here you're saying, actually, here's another read, by the way. Yeah. Haman is the one who makes keeps making mistakes and Ahasuerus keeps himself really clean and above board and he's very smart. So that could well, be another way to read it. He's Yeah, he's being used. He's being, um, he's being but used. you know that uh, okay. I, I have to say that there's no historical evidence for the point. One of the points that's made in the book that yeah. once a decree is made, it can't be withdrawn. Right, there's we discussed no that. historical Correct. basis for that. So it's part of the plot that they use, and and if we want to look at it through anti-Semitism, what we can say is that the anti-Semites in the book, Haman and his family are idiots. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're, they're so incompetent that they end up being hanged on their own gallows. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, I, I do see it dealing with anti-Semitism, but this is a triumphant book. We won. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were just, because anti-Semitism is idiotic, they were idiots. Mm. So okay. briefly, briefly, yes. that's sorry, sorry. just my yeah. take. 
no, I appreciate that. And I want to, um, I want everybody to feel comfortable keeping that in mind. I do want to move on Lance. Oh, um, I have a to totally say? different take. And that okay, is, so can we save you for a different time? Because I think it's enough time taken on a different day. Sure. Absolutely. You can write it to me and then I'm happy to. Yeah, great. So I let's put it in the yes, chat. We could offer that. You can. Yeah, you can always put things in the chat. That's no problem. Thank you. Okay. No, problem. that's great. Thank you for offering. And I appreciate that. I just don't want to take too much time on each class. But I thought it's important to bring those points in that there's more than one lens and to bring another lens. And I think that once we say it, then people can keep it in mind. Okay. I want to go to where, um, where we left off last time. Just a moment. I have it in my book. Anybody, any thoughts from last time that they wanted to share? That's also fine. here we go okay we got up to the ninth verse in the first chapter we said we would start today in verse 10 verse 10 of chapter one remember where we are the part we're still kind of in the party vashti has appeared on the scene because in verse nine we learned that vashti also made a party and people actually offered some interesting insights about why she might have made the party. Okay. And and remember, I'm bringing Midrashim in addition to the text. The text we know how to read. It's, it's Hebrew and it's English. <laughs> but I like to add the Midrashim to give another point of view and also to show what Chazal, what our sages brought us. The main ones that I've found right now so far, but I have more coming in as we go along, is the Gra, the Vilna Gaon, this Megillat Sitarim, this hidden Megillah that shed some light that I didn't even know about before I started my research. And the Gemara in Megillah. So the Gemara is a very solid, for us, it's a very solid basis for interpretation. Um, and Rashi, for example, uh, following a few specific ones. Let's go to verse nine. So what happens, remember we had 180 day, 180 day feast. And that was followed by a seven day feast for, we're not sure, we read it a few different ways, but the Jews seem to be there. Remember we talked about, and this is still something that I like, Shushan Habira, the capital city of Shushan or Ha'ir Shushan, the city Shushan, which we said is like a small case S that the Jews were not allowed to live in Shushan Habira, the capital city, but they happened to be there. Those who came on official visits or those who came for the party maybe. Okay, but Yom HaShavii, so on the seventh day, we're on the, remember one, verse seven, how people brought text, Hebrew or English is fine. Chapter one, verse 10. But Yom HaShavii on the seventh day, Kitov Lev HaMelech Bayayin. When the king's heart was merry, that's a good translation, with wine, he said to his advisors, Mehuman bista harvona biktava bakta zeitar v'charkas. So Mehuman, reminds us of Haman. Not clear that that's Haman, but it reminds us of Haman. Shivata Sarisim, the seven, so a Saris is a eunuch actually in Hebrew, but that's not the way it's translated. Now, the reason that we have eunuchs is the ones who work in the women's palace so that they will not lust after the king's you know, harem. Shiva, the seven Sarisim. So I would say that if it is eunuchs who are working in the women's palace, Mehuman may not be Haman because we have no indication that he was a Saris. And in fact, he was married. So it doesn't seem like it. Hamashartim at Pnei Mel Hashverosh. These are the, it says Chamberlains. Chamberlains? Well, how do you pronounce it? Chamberlains. Chamberlains. The Chamberlains who were working for the game. And what is, so he turns to them. I just want to say that something that I read, everyone is sitting around at this party and they're, they've all drunk. We know, well, we think they've all drunk. At least these are, these people. And what did they hear? Maybe they're actually hearing the women in the women's palace, whether they're singing or they're talking or clinking glasses, but they know, you know, the women 
had a feast. So there's a lot of women there. Somebody here said, Elaine, was it? Somebody said that maybe the husbands were having fun. So um, Vashti decided that the wives should be invited. We don't know who were invited to that or just the women in the harem or other people. A drunken discussion begins and they start saying the men to each other, you know, this is really very misogynistic what happens in Megillat Esther. The women from my province are more beautiful. The women from my province are more beautiful. And Achashverosh says to them, my wife, remember who his wife is, she's the descendant from the one Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, I can't remember what he's called exactly, who conquered the world after conquering Jerusalem and Israel. Not from Parasumadai. She's not from any of these places. And she is the most beautiful. And we do have teachings that she was, I mean, that's the Midrashim say, that she was very, very beautiful, which we mentioned that could have been one of the reasons, at least, that Achashverosh married her, the other one being political question. And it was interesting when I was learning the Midrashim, I saw that there were different bends. Like one of them was that he really loved her or he lusted after her. He actually didn't want anything to happen to her. Um, but one direction was that it was because she was so beautiful and he fell in love with her beauty, perhaps. But the other one was because of the political reasons, the power. Either way, it actually makes no sense to get rid of Vashti. Any of these readings, there's no logic involved. I want you to park that and keep that in mind. So because he says this, one minute, let me just see if there was something else to add here. No, okay, let's go to verse 11. So what does he do? He turns to his servants, his chamberlains, and he says, Lavi et Vashti Hamalka. I want you to bring Queen Vashti. Now, and it's interesting. Remember, we said Shushan Abira Ha'ir Shushan, Shushan, the capital or the city Shushan. So what is noticed here is that sometimes it says Malka Vashti, Queen Vashti, and sometimes it says Vashti the Queen. Now, what's the difference when I say Queen Vashti or Vashti the Queen? Yes, Ruby. One second, Lance. Ruby, unmute. One, one is sounds more, uh, Queen Vashti sounds more permanent. Well, Vashti the Queen sounds like it could be, could be, could be changed. Could be changed. Okay, it sounds more temporary. Which yeah. one gives her more honor? I say Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti. Okay. Anybody else have a thought different from this one? <laughs> if you agree, that's great, but we don't need to. So Queen Vashti. So I just want people to start noticing. These are things that I never noticed until I started learning it. I didn't notice that sometimes it said Shushan Abira and sometimes it said Hayir Shushan. I didn't notice that sometimes it said Malka Vashti and sometimes it said Vashti Ha Malka. And I think Ruby, your read is exactly correct. Because Vashti Hamalka, Vashti the queen, feels like that there's a, a role to fill called the queen, and they're kind of interchangeable. We'll drop Vashti in there, we'll drop somebody else in there, whereas Queen Vashti feels like it gives her her own stature. Mm -hmm. And given the background that we said politically, that she actually came with a lot of power because she came from a family that ruled the world at one point, not that long ago, or the known world at that time, then she the reason that Akashverosh is even marrying her is for the political power. But when he calls her Vashti the queen, and he doesn't call her Queen Vashti, he's demoting her just by these two words, just by flipping them. Now, mm -hmm. this doesn't have to do with anti-Semitism. That's why I said not everything we're going to learn is about anti-Semitism. It will come up as we go along, of course. But I just think it's so interesting because when we hear the Megillah on Purim, which Rosh Chodesh is, is almost here, and that means we're six weeks away. There's an extra Adar this year. It's a leap year. We're exactly six weeks away. Matzai Shabbat in six weeks will be Purim. These are things that now are going to jump out at me. I'm now going to notice when it's read, when does it say Malka Vashti? And when does it say Vashti Malka? And I wanted to put it on your radar as well. I mean, I'm sure we can't remember everything that we're learning, but we can remember some of the things. Okay. So, so here's the thing. Before the king, in other words, bring her from the queen's harem, from the queen's, from the women's palace. 
So I want to ask you something. To bring her with her crown, with her crown of royalty. Why does he say that? Does he think that she's going to come without her crown? Yes, Marvin has something to say. Go for the midrash on that one. Go for it. And it says, Beketa Mahut, that she's to come in front of the audience only wearing the crown. Exactly. To be naked otherwise. Exactly. And now you, thank you. Now you see, we all, or a lot of us have heard this midrash, but where did they get it from? Why did they make it up, so to speak? Why did they imagine that a Hashvei Rosh is telling her to come naked? Because why else would he say to come with, with her crown? Why does the Pasuk add Becheter Malchut with her crown of royalty unless he meant something deeper? I mean, you could say, he just said, and make sure she comes looking as royal as possible. You could say that. But but if we're reading it from a perspective that each word is thoughtful, which I agree, usually the Torah is read that way. I thought it was so interesting to read Megillat Esther that way as well. But this is where the Midrash comes from. Just so you know, when Midrashim are written, they're always hooked onto something. There's a reason that something in the text sparked an idea for Midrash. So that was it. And Marvin not only remembered that, but he remembered it exactly at this point. Yeah. Yes. Vivian, did you want to add something? No, I, I uh, the way yeah. you're explaining it is the way I learned it. Yeah. So, that uh, is Becheta Malchut with her crown, yeah, but only. But nothing else. Yeah. Uh, right, but nothing else. I why? why? And why do that? Because she's a sex object. She's a yeah. beauty object, which goes back a little bit to what Ruby said, that she's maybe interchangeable, that she was appointed to be queen, at least partly for her baby. Laharot ha'amim v'hasarim, to show all the nations and the ministers et yofia, her beauty. Mm -hmm. tovat marehi. So it says here that she looks beautiful. Tovat mare, mare means her appearance, and tova is good. So goodly, you could call it. It says her handsome in appearance. Now, if we don't know, of course, if she really was ordered to come naked. I mean, we don't, it's not written here that she was ordered to come naked. But if Ahasuerus did command her to do that, what was his reasoning? Oh, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Who said that? Oh, Felice. <laughs> Felice, were you talking about, are you having trouble getting on? Yeah, no. I'm, do you hear me? No. Yes, I hear you. Oh, okay. I had a different interpretation when Vashti Hamalka, I was thinking that maybe it was something positive. Like it says, Havias Vashti Hamalka, meaning that she was the one who, even though he may have had other wives, but she was the one who was known as the queen. Oh, nice. Now, and I'll be the reverse of what I think Judy said or somebody else. Oh, you know, that's I'm, very I'm, interesting. Thank you, Felice. Yeah. That, that just shows that you could read the same thing. Right. Very right. good. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you. Although you still could have said Queen Vashti. Now, I would agree but, with but, but, it said, but, it said, but it says Ha Malka. It doesn't say yeah. Vashti, Ma Malka yeah. Vashti. It says Ha Malka. I mean, she was the one who was known as the queen, even though we may have had other concubines, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was referred to as the queen. Very good. Very nice read. And let's just notice from now on when it says Malka Vashti and when it says Vashti Malka. Phyllis. Hmm. I was going to just say when you had said we can um, read this from different points of view, I also um, learned from a, very, a feminist point of view that she was asked to come just to wear um, the crown. And, and that was the reason, um, the main reason that she didn't want to go because of you know, feeling that um, she was just yeah. being looked at as a sex object. Right, which completely takes away the whole idea of her being royal and a queen. I mean, it's and really hard to feel self-confident and royal when you're naked. What is, what, what do royalty, what, what do royalty generally wear? They not only wear clothing, they wear fancy clothing and extra layers special. Of clothing and special clothing and clothing that has precious jewels. And that has, I mean, there's a reason they do that. Most people are not, you know, impressed necessarily with nakedness. It's just, it's totally unfathomable to me. I have to say that this was even something that could happen. It's just so goes against everything in me, but these are still the Midrashim. Now, it's interesting that perhaps 
even learning this particular midrash, what did we say? We said in the previous pasuk, "Kitov leb hamelech biyayin," when he was yeah, healing, that, that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he was drunk. I don't know if he would have done that if he wasn't drunk. People who are drunk, mm -hmm. and he's been drinking for a very long time now—six months plus a week. Oh. And they, you know, people who are drunk. I mean, I've mentioned this before. I have trouble with people um, not being able to handle alcohol. It's hard for me that because I had experience with that in my life with people who abuse, you know, whether they did on purpose or not, but that alcohol can, can definitely, itch. I mean, that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to make you feel good about yourself. It's meant to make you feel more empowered. It's meant to make you feel more relaxed. That's often why people drink, but when it's done too much, then people, it'll be abused because then people will not have any checks and balances on what they say or do. So I want to you yeah. get a chance. No, I don't want to interrupt you. I can't. I couldn't find how to raise my hand. Oh, you couldn't find. Okay, I think it's in the. Um, no, 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 I see it now. Okay. Yeah, fine. the reactions. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Bert. What would you like to say? Yeah, what I was going to say. I also am familiar with a medrash that she didn't want to come because she quote grew a tail. That's one of the uh, one of the. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I heard that. One of the one of the most fanciful oh, medrash that appeals to children. So that she somehow or another got some sort of defect that looked like a tail or something, and she that embarrassed her, and that was why she didn't do that. I right. don't know why, but I don't know why I don't know why Hazal decided that that was something worthy of speculating about. You know that there was some other motivation for her well, not coming. I think that the reason, continuing on with this thought, I just wanted to finish the and thank you. Um, the idea that perhaps that connects because. Otherwise, why was it so important for the text to tell us that when his heart was merry with wine? Like, why was mm -hmm. that important to say? We know that they've been drinking, but maybe that, wait, Phyllis, did you, you spoke. No, no, I, no, uh, Felice, I want to just, yeah. What did you want to add, Felice? No, I just wanted to say that I was thinking also that maybe he wasn't really his normal self. He was drinking and he may have even been drunk. And he would just say anything. Oh, that came to my mind, you know. I want Vashti to get undressed and show everybody how she looks. Right. Oh, I have a wonderful, <laughs> I don't know how to imitate a drunk person, but I can imagine a drunk person. I have this great idea, you know, we'll bring my wife naked so everybody can see how beautiful she is. And they right. will marvel that I, yes. But I and, now, well, and now also, Brock, we know that he used to like to drink us throughout the Megillah. It says when they ate, they drank, well, most of the time, they drank also with Haman, with um, other people. So he was accustomed to be, you know, drinking alcohol, but maybe something yeah. had a little bit too much. Right. Oh, he definitely had. It says, yeah. Now yes. I wanted to respond, thank you, to what Bert said, that we know other, that she broke out in Sara'at and lesions like Sarat, which is the skin. Leprosy. Leprosy. No, it's actually, so I, I oh, need no. to correct that. Sorry. Oh. It's not leprosy. Leprosy oh, is Hansen's disease, and it is cured with um, antibiotics. Oh, but that's the, now it is, yeah. Well, it always could have been cured with antibiotics. Yeah. They but didn't they didn't know. They didn't, people, doctors didn't but, know. But the least, yeah. Yes, but what I'm trying to say is it's like a spiritual leprosy. So oh, is, I see. It's not something that you get because you contract it from somebody else, and then you can get rid of it with antibiotics. Sarat so is because of whatever sins that people do that bring tarat on them. So that's why I don't like to call it leprosy because it's a misnomer. But that's yeah, that's fine. true. Okay. So so some say Chazal said she had tarat, so then she had lesions on her skin, so she didn't look beautiful, or she grew a tail, um, things that would obviously okay. be so much more embarrassing, which is interesting because that means if it goes along with the Midrash that she was asked to appear naked, it wasn't the nakedness that bothered her. Like she was still willing to come somehow. And I don't know how, but Maybe it was common for women to come naked. I, I can't explain. <laughs> but I think that that's what it comes from, Bert. Like what could be the reason that she refused? Now, if you take away the issue of the nakedness, then it makes sense that that would be the reason she wouldn't agree. So mm -hmm. that would be a way to balance it. It would make sense. A Chazal would say maybe it's different Chazal who said not that she was willing, that she had to appear naked, but that she you know looked like a freak and therefore, because otherwise, maybe she would be willing to be the only woman and have people marvel at her beauty. I don't know. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the Gemara adds, and this is, yes, Milton. Yeah, there's uh, a further downgrading of Vashti 
a little later on where yeah. the term Malka doesn't appear either before or after her name. Nice. Just simply Where's Ashley. that? When does that happen? It was on, uh, the king forgot, but well, he remembers her, I think. Nine, after, but, after the advisors advise, it's uh, 19. 19. Oh, yeah, fair, beautiful. Hold that. That's great. When we get to 19, you'll. I'm, I'm making myself a, a star there. One that's second. true. Terrific, mm -hmm. Milton. Well done. Well done. So that's a further downgrading. And that's a really nice, closer reading of the text. Appreciate it. Um, one second. Um, um, Bracha also. Can I say one thing? Sure. Yeah, I was going to just say, it just says Vashti maybe in Pasuk Yotet because she was no longer a queen. She was dead. So it wouldn't be Malka Vashti. Well, well, why, don't we, just... why, don't, why don't we wait until we get there? Because that's an interesting okay. thought. But I think we need to look more deeply in the Pasuk. So let's just wait because we're not there yet. Okay. okay? Hold that thought. Okay. okay. What I wanted to add was something else. Again, this is an anti-Semitic read and it's a Midrashic read. Okay. The Gemara says that Vashti would have, the reason Vashti would have agreed to come naked in spite of her own humili humiliation was in order to tempt the Jews to sin and bring them down. Afhi davar aver even she wanted to bring them down, which is interesting to cast Vashti in that light. Now, I will say, in general, Chazal tends to paint people often as all good or all bad. So, you know, it, it's hard to know. Some people try to redeem Vashti and say she was just a pawn. But this was another interesting read that, Perhaps she also had anti-Semitic uh, thoughts, and that would be why she would agree. I mean, does that speak to anyone here? Does that, can anybody, does that make sense to people that she would do it just in order to bring the Jews down? No, no. Jews aren't even mentioned in the text at this point. Right. Well, Somebody asked that last time, were there really Jews? But that's a straight well, up. Please, board meeting. please read my chat. And I will answer these questions in my in the chat. Okay, you're invited to read the chat. I don't think I have time, but one second. Yes, Marvin. The Midrash came from many sources. Right. The Babylonian sources tended to paint Vashti as a rabid anti-Semite. Right. While mm. the other sources did not. Mm. Right, so that's why there were different ones. Yeah. He's just so, and a pawn. Know, yes. See where you're nice. Coming. Right. Very nice. So I don't have that source, but I can. Um, okay. okay. We, we can't, I can't read the length of that, but we said maybe we'll give you a couple of minutes on another class to say a different length. Okay. All right. All right. Continuing on here. Let's continue on. In any case, love you. Da, da. Right. We're now up to 12. But to my end, Hamalka Vashti, she refused. I just want to say, I feel like the reason that the nakedness, the tail, and the tzarat comes up, because otherwise, why would she refuse? Again, showing that the midrash is hooked on text in, on the text, but Tima'en, and she refused. But what reason would she have to refuse? She would only enrage the king. If she didn't have any of these, yes, Felice. No, I was just say that maybe we don't know. It doesn't say she was or she wasn't modest. Maybe it went against her grain. And when it says Hamal Kavashin, that she has some say in what she does. Oh, she that was is, the queen. So maybe she's showing power. Oh, maybe she's showing I'm a Malka and I can't. I don't want to do it. I don't have to listen nice. to whatever you say. Good answer. Great. Anybody else have a thought? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Phyllis. That she doesn't want to parade herself in front of this crowd, even with clothing. E yeah, either way, yeah. But especially, in, <laughs> especially what without clothing. No, so that's no, no. I I was just rolling it back and saying, even if we didn't have these midrashim, the reason the midrashim came is because why else? They're saying, well, why did she refuse? What what reasons she have? Yeah. This is actually giving her you know, a place to show she's beautiful, she has power, she's the one that King picked, whatever, solidifying the relationship. 
So I think that the Midrashim are saying, well, there must have been a reason. So yeah. Felice thinks a reason could be to show that she has power. That is one read. I just mm-hmm. want to point out that the Midrashim based it on something. Ruby. I just question how many Jews would have the power or position to have even seen that nakedness. You know, are we talking about just the people of the, of the royal court? The average average Jew would be in a physical position yeah. to see her nakedness? Well, one second. I just want to say this is the one that's after the six months. I'm going back a minute. Mm-hmm. No, one second. Where was the one? Where's the pasuk that we read that he made a second one? Oh, here it is. On hay in the fifth verse. Mm-hmm. That when the 180 days were done, uh, this is verse five. Hanim tseim b'shushan habira. So this was for everybody. I mean, you're mm-hmm. right. It doesn't say Jews. Mm-hmm. It sounds like, but it sounds like everybody was invited. And the Am means Am Yisrael or Am Hayudi. You're right. It's mm-hmm. not shot in the they, text. They didn't have a television set. They didn't have an No, no, yet. no. This would be yeah. that they invited for the seven day, the commoners. One second, Vivian. Okay. That's commoners. Yes. No, but it's a good point. Yes, Vivian. Mm-hmm. Vivian, did you want to add? Yeah, I wanted to mention that uh, according to them, the, the Jewish women had no power whatsoever because they could be sent off by, by their parents and arranged marriages and all that, and they had no say in it. But And he or she had a lot of power, so I think she was showing the, uh, the, 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 the difference between her her action and her power and Jewish women who had no power. Okay, thank you. That's um, interesting. And that adds to what Felice said. Okay, do you have something to add, Felice? Because I'd like to move on. Yeah, 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 very quickly. When um Pasuk Tet, it says, Gam Bashi Hamalka, Asasam Nishtet. So she made a, a party also. She may have been a little drunk too. And she said, I'm not going to come now. I can't walk straight. I might fall over. Nice, okay. nice. I was drinking it's also. Beautiful. You're really getting inside Vashti's head. Very, very good. Excellent points. Thank you for adding that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So in, in you, no, this is great. I'm I'm really, I have to say, we did this in Megillat Root. We did what we said, you know, trying to get into the heads of the people, really trying to do a barefoot reading. So this is both Midrashic and barefoot. And I really love that because you're putting yourself into what the setting could be. Well, Forget the anti-Semitic part, although that was a nice contrast with the women, the Jewish women. So she refuses to come. And here, let's notice that in 12, Hamal Kavashti, I think as Felice noted, it switched. He told Vashti, the queen, that she should come. But the queen Vashti said, no, I'm not coming. Mm-hmm. Whether they did, whether she didn't want to be paraded, whether because she was drunk, whether because she drew a tail, whatever the reason was. Uh, so she didn't want to accept the note, you know, back and forth in the hands of the chamberlains or the eunuchs. The king was very angry and his fury fired or burnt within him. Now I want to ask you what stands out for you in the, in the last part of this verse. Anybody have a thought? Well, the, the king is humiliated in front of his people that his wife refused him. That his wife refused him. And the Midrash picks up on the fact that there are two different expressions of his anger. It's not just like Tzof HaMelech Me'od that he was very, well, ketsef, you know what ketsef is? It's foam. It's like foaming in anger. So vayiktsof is another word for anger, but it, it's this idea of foaming in anger. Vachamato, and this anger or fury burnt within him. So the Midrash asks, why are there two? And again, I'm just showing you why the Midrash, I'm going to tell you this Midrash, what it, what it reads here. You know, there's a lot of humiliation going on back and forth. And in some ways, I want to say, I do want to give Vashti a little bit of credit <laughs> that she didn't have much agency and yet she still 
found a way to fight back or to to hold her own. I mean, in the end, she didn't remain. And we also are going, you know, similarly with Esther, of course, we are assuming that God was also behind her, but I give Esther huge amounts of credit. But even Vashti, I can't step away from the fact that she was in an untenable position. She had no power really. And yet she kept as much of her dignity and composure as she could, not about composure, but dignity. So the Gura, the Vilna Gaon, it's a little hard for me to argue with the Vilna Gaon. So I am bringing the Vilna Gaon. He notices that there are two expressions of anger. And what he says is, he imagines that Vashti didn't just say, no, I'm not coming. But Vashti added something insulting to Ahasuerus. So remember we said that Ahasuerus was probably pretty drunk. It even says that he was. And she says like this, my grandfather, remember these, this is also insulting because she's reminding him, you only got all this stuff because you married me. My grandfather's stable boys who watched the horses drink liquor or drank alcohol and never made such a disgusting request. You Where did you say that? No, yeah. I said, this is a midrash. A uh, midrash, okay. Yeah, no, there's a lot of, I'm bringing a lot of midrashim in this class. Oh. I, what, where does it say that? Well, where does it say the tale? But we all accept the tale because we learned it as kids, right? So this is a midrash you didn't hear. And and that's okay. I'm just bringing you a new midrash. Now, the second time you'll hear it, you'll be like, oh, I heard that midrash once. So this midrash says, the reason there are two layers of fury, here's the thing, Rit, listen, listen to this. Ma'od is outwardly, he looks like he's angry, he's foaming. He had anger inside of him that he couldn't reveal because if she, that's where the Midrash gets it. Because if she sent him an insulting and they imagine what the insulting could be, it could have been anything. You're a fool, you're an idiot, whatever it is. I'm never going to, you know, do you, how could you dare? She's made it, you know, they made it something even more. My grandfather's stable boys drank and never made it so disgusting. You know, she was uh, using hyperbole here. Why don't you grow up? She sent the vrai bizayon. But the Midrash gets it from the text because in addition to the outward anger, inward, he was seething. That's where the Midrash gets it from. <laughs> okay. See, that's part of it. I love learning where Midrash gets it from. And it's um, it <laughs> feels really beautiful to understand that Midrashim are not just made up. Stam. <laughs> They're made up with the reason. There you go. Okay. Everybody good? We're continuing. Uh, anybody raise their hand? No. Okay. Yud Gimel, 13. Yes, Robert. And uh, extrapolating from what you're saying, if uh, the king, basically uh, Vashti got to him and the king couldn't reveal that, <laughs> that her insult had gotten to him in, in, in front of all the whatever the uh, insult was yeah. yeah wait what about that sorry oh he couldn't reveal say it again maybe i missed what you said i apologize he, he, he has to, he can he has to contain within himself the foaming anger that you described well the foaming because... was external the hamatoba arabo was inside yeah right he couldn't add the extra level but we all know that when somebody says no and when somebody says no in a derogatory fashion, it is a hundred times more insulting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's much higher. It's much, you know, the level of it. Okay, thank you. So now he is turning to the Chachamim, the sages, the wise people. Yodei ha'itim. What is Yodei ha'itim? What does that mean? Those who knew the itim, the times. Those who knew how to fix time, who knew when when the calendar was working. Now, remember, going back to the previous, um, her father was Baal Shatzar, her grandfather was Nebuchadnezzar, or maybe it was great-grandfather, I'm not sure. No, here it says Vashti was the daughter of Baal Shatzar. And we said that they erroneously calculated how many years that, that the Jews would be in exile. And that was the reason that they thought that they could kill the Jews, that God wasn't on their side because the time has passed. They weren't brought back. In the end, they had miscalculated. According to this, and there's, there's more teaching here. I don't want to go into all of it. So the Ahai team would be the Jewish Chachamim. 
It would be the Sanhedrin. Who knows how to calculate time? The Jews are great at it because that's what we do every month. That's exactly what we were so well versed in, in the calendar. We said that Rabban Gamliel, when he brought in the Adim, the witnesses who said that they saw the new moon, he had pictures to show them. He said, did it look like this? Did it look like this? Did it look like this? I mean, that's what, that's our tradition. So according to this, why, otherwise, why write Yodei Ha'itim? What does that add? We're so used to hearing it, we don't even think about it. But why add it? The reason to add it is to pinpoint that actually this is our Chachamim. Because this was the king's custom to present a case before people, I don't know what this was about. That doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds democratic, which honestly, I didn't know that there was any democracy there, but mm -hmm. it's that that was part of it. That was because that's what this actually is in the text. So we can't argue with that. Just one minute. And he's turning to them for advice. He's presenting the case. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then going to 14. So according to this interpretation, first turning to the Jewish sages. Vakarov elav, the nearest to him, meaning his, his ministers. Karshana sheitarad matar kershish meres marsena. These are the ones who were the ministers of these 127 provinces. So first he turns to the Jews, and then it looks like only then does he turn to the other ministers. And I'll tell you in a minute why. What should we do? What should be, what should be the response? Because she didn't follow what the queen, what the king commanded. I don't know why it keeps saying that the king sent the message with the messengers. I don't know if anybody has an idea. It's the third time we've heard about that. Okay, hold on one second. He, according to, um, oh, okay. The Gura says that he thought Ahasuerosh had a real dilemma. He actually didn't want to kill Vashti. Now, by the way, I just want to say it doesn't say that he killed Vashti. I no. just want everybody to look, right. We, we we can look very hard in the text. It doesn't actually say that he killed her. Maybe banished her. I just want I just want to hold that thought in your mind. That did she really die? Was she really killed? Look for it in the text. See if you can find it. Not there. You, can't. you can't. I know. And we take it for granted that she was killed. Maybe she was put in a prison to languish for the rest of her life. Maybe she was sent home to her other palaces. And kept as a prisoner, I would imagine. But yes, yeah, maybe. He didn't want to kill her because the things we've said, she was very beautiful. He had married her by for political reasons. So maybe he's realizing also he made a mistake because he was drunk and then she didn't respond to him and she didn't agree to what he said. But remember, he married her, according to what we learned, partly because she was beautiful, partly because there was a marrying for political reasons and the power. He doesn't want to undo that in the eyes of the nation but he can't ignore the insult. And here's what I wrote for myself, just in my notes. He's looking for a clever way out. That on one hand, according to a certain reading, he really did hate the Jews. On the other hand, he couldn't ignore the fact that they were smart and that he could turn to them for advice because they often had good things to say. And actually they did good things for him. Mordecai saved his life, for example. And to me, I wrote a note does this feel familiar? Hating the Jews and needing them and recognizing their worth at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that's what came up for me when I, when I read this. Now, why would it be that he turns to Yud Gimel, to the Yodei Ha'itim, as again, according to this uh, interpretation, to the Jews who know the Itim, who know how to know the calendar? And, and again, it had to do with fixing which day it was, but I didn't find it particularly compelling or interesting. But Yodei team was interesting to me. And then he turned to his advisors. Why? The Gemara says that our sages had a dilemma. If we tell him to kill his wife, tomorrow he'll wake up sober and he'll kill us for telling him to kill his wife. But if we don't tell him now to kill his wife, he will be furious with them and kill them. So they they had they felt like they had no recourse. They didn't find a clever way around it. Interestingly, Mimuchan, which we will learn according to the Midrash, is Haman or could be Haman. Um, 
So they said to, is the one who came up with something clever to suit his own needs. They said to him, from the time the temple was destroyed, so that reminds, you know, reminds him, oh, you have the power, you destroyed our temple. We don't have clarity and we don't have an answer for you. And therefore in Pasuk, in verse 14, he turns to his Persian and Madai, Paraso Madai uh, counselors and asks them to help. That's why he went to his other advisors. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, one second. I just want to note it, want everybody to notice that in Pasuk Tetvab in 15, he flips it back. Before he said Vashtiya Malka. Now he says what to do with Malka Vashti. Why is he bumping up her stature? Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. In a good way, in a bad way, if, or what's what could be his motivation for this? We do notice that it's flipped. It's hard to ignore that. If he wants her kept alive, he would upgrade his, her status. Yes, if he wanted her kept alive, he would upgrade. That's one read, I think. And, and there, a lot of the Midrashim go in that direction, that he didn't want to kill her, actually. So he's reminding them, wait a minute, she's a queen in her own right. Okay, good. But I feel like it could be read either way, just saying. Maybe it's also to say that the queen is not allowed to disobey me. Maybe. I don't know, just the thought. He's, he's also speaking to uh, his peers, the princes, and um, to show she's worthy of consideration, he's calling her the queen. She's, she's worthy of this, um, you know, thought, these thoughts about her. Wait, worthy about which thoughts, Elaine? I wasn't- uh, About consideration, about bringing these princes together for consideration because she is the queen. She's oh, not oh, oh 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 she's not some lowly that okay got it got nice it's it's not some lowly whatever thank you I don't know what they're called the the ones from his harem who if she disobeyed he would just off with her head let's say mm -hmm. but because she's the queen very nice that's a very nice read that she that the queen didn't do it so therefore I'm consulting with you okay all right by the way just so you know given that it's leap year this year the whole um, discussion here about why he needed to consult with the Chachamim had to do with it being whether it was a leap year or not, that that would make a difference for the calculation of time. And I just read today, something I'm going to say in Milcham Arav, is that um, why do we celebrate Purim in Adar Sheni? So you're getting a preview of what I'm going to say in Milcham Arav. Why do, why, like this year we have a leap year, Adar Aleph, Adar Bet. Could you imagine a reason for um, celebrating Purim in the first Adar or the second Adar? What what could be? We celebrate it in the second Adar so that it's always a month before Pesach. A month before Pesach, yes, great, great. But you could imagine that also the first Adar means it's 12 months. And didn't we say in the 12th month, not the 13th? So there's, um, I think it was 12 months. So uh, Rav Eliel Kitov in Sefer Toda gives these reasons. He says that it was a leap year the year that it happened. It was a leap year that the Chachamim, as every year, they need to, they decree what you have to add in Adar. By the way, why do we add a leap month? It's, mm. it's to shift the Hebrew calendar, the secular and the Jewish calendar, so that they'll align. So Pesach will always be in the spring. And so that, right, so those, that's the reason you have to keep doing it. Otherwise, if you don't correct it, it'll drift, drift, drift the way Ramadan drifts. Mm -hmm. And it's actually on any month of the year as it drifts around the calendar. So so the Chachamim had set up that year that it'll be, and it happened to be, it was in the second Adar. So that makes sense. That to me is such a compelling reason. I mean, I wasn't there, but Rabbi Liao Kito was one of my personal heroes. So I trust him. And uh, I've told you the Sefer Tadra Book of Our Heritage, I think is an excellent book. And I'll be bringing um, th um, teachings from there. The other reason he said is because, so this is from the Gemara, I think that, Geula, uh, I don't have the quote right here. Somchim Geula Le Geula or something like that, that we put the, um, uh, the redemption of Purim near the redemption of Pesach, that it, they should be close to each other. So here's the interesting thing that I read from somebody else that I thought was beautiful. I guess we'll have to finish with this. Oh, it's just so much. It's so much fun to share when I learn something that <laughs> that is beautiful to me. What is the difference between the Geula of Pesach and the Geula of Purim? They're very different. Geula 
of Purim, uh, Hashem is hidden in the Megillah. However, in Pesach, um, he is very visible. Very visible, very front and center. So this teaching is that we actually start the year from Pesach. Remember, Pesach is the first month in the Torah. Why? Because that's when we became a nation. That, let's put Rosh Hashanah aside. That's the birthday of the world. But Pesach, Nisan, is the birthday of the Jewish nation. And that's when the Jewish nation came out of Egypt. They were fledgling. They were immature as a nation and needed God to be very, very visible. But over the course of these 11, 12 months, we've matured. And Purim represents being able to recognize God's hand, even when it's not miraculous miracles that happen in front of us. So it's a beautiful way to make them adjacent to each other and show us the difference, but the difference in a very beautiful way. Ah, thank you, everybody. Thank we you. got up to Mimuchan. We're going to learn about Mimuchan next time. There's a lot to say about him. And we'll go into Perik Bet. And um, I thank you for joining me. Thank you. And thank by the you. way, Ted, I'm counting on you when you see something funny to raise your hand. <laughs> I, I do want to say something, by the way, I do want to actually add something, which I was going to say about what Ted said. Um, so th this is actually in memory of my brother, who uh, my brother Avi, he's the one who taught me this. He, um, he passed away, Pesach actually, two years ago now. I guess it'll be two years. Is that true? Yeah, it must be two years. And he he actually suffered from, um, he, he, no, I won't say suffered from. He had depression and that's not what he died from, but he did struggle and was challenged by um, uh, depression. And also at times in his life and also people in the family have uh, illnesses, you know, whether it's bipolar, depression. We, we know that my sister who died two years before him, she died from depression through suicide. And he really recognized it. And later in life, he was a very, very, very talented person. And he just kept trying new, new things. I mean, he's a, um, he was a professor, a doctorate. He taught in Hong Kong. He did many beautiful things. And he decided to turn his hand to comedy, which, you know, you need a lot of courage to, to, um, to turn to comedy. You're really putting yourself out there. And his dream was that first he would establish himself somehow, you know, in some way as a comedian. He did actually do some of the com comic circuit. Um, you know, COVID kind of cut that, but then he turned his, he did other things via Zoom um, about comedy. But here was his goal. His goal was eventually to talk about mental illness as a comedian, to talk about it and to bring it to the forefront through comedy. And he was really passionate about it. I'm, I'm sad that he didn't get, I'm sad obviously that he died, but I'm sad that he didn't get that opportunity. He had a goal that was larger than just being a comedian because there's something about, and this is what I was thinking about what you said, Ted, that it's a, co a comic story with overtones of seriousness or undertones or highlight or whatever you want to call it. Because sometimes comedy is a great way to circumvent our um, inhibitions about talking about serious things head on and the way we want to push it away. But comedy can allow us to come into it from an easier direction. So it's a tool or a skill. And for me, thank you. I want to thank you for bringing something my brother had told me you know, five years ago, four or five years ago when he turned to this direction. I had, I had forgotten about that. And you mm -hmm. reminded me of that. So I want to thank you. And I still think that could be very powerful. And so I'm hoping that my read and your read will find ways to coexist. Well, uh, uh, just to point out, there are two ways of looking at comedy. One is that it's funny stuff. That's how we use it today. But comedy originally just meant a happy ending. Dante's okay. Divine Comedy doesn't have a lot of laughs in it. Oh, it now that's interesting. Nice, nice. Thank you. So I'll add a, a joke from my brother to finish off. He yeah. said, there are three kinds of people in this world. Mm -hmm. Those who can count and those who can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three kinds of people in this world. Okay. Ah, nice. A little delayed reaction. Okay. Yeah, 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 it's a third. Yeah. It's a good yeah. one. That's yeah. the point. There is no third. Okay, friends. Thank you. Thank I hope you'll join next week as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.